Welcome and thank you for tuning in to our shop talk to learn about NHSN updates and technical assistance. We are glad you are with us today. And no, we are here to help and support you now and always. We expect by the end of this presentation that you will be able to verify your NHSN data using the newly revised QA criteria and understand how to ensure your facility always as a user who can input data in the NHSN. My name is Mary Lee Johnson, and I'm one of three members of the patient safety team at Alliant Quality. I've been the technical advisor for infection prevention for four years with Alliant, and prior to that, I worked in hospitals and with public health. Amy Ward is also a member of our team. She is our infection prevention specialist and has recent experience working on the front lines as a nurse in a large hospital system. She is managing the Q&A live today and will answer as many questions as possible. We also have two guest panelists from user support at NHSN to address issues around gaining access to your facility. Andrew Turner and Robert Maxwell. Let us pause just for a moment and reflect on how much we have accomplished the past year. The work you have done to protect your residents, coworkers, family members, and friends from getting COVID, and the work you are doing to help them heal. A year ago, we didn't know this virus would become a daily part of our lives at work and at home. I want to share a perspective using Brian Sexton's method of three good things. You may have heard about this daily practice of naming three good things over a three-month period. It's proven to reduce depression. So, here are three good things. We have CDC guidelines, guidelines that will protect residents, coworkers, family, friends, myself, or yourself, from spreading the virus. We have two vaccines available that will prevent me or you from getting sick. And we have lab tests that will let us know within 15 minutes if a person is positive for the virus. We also have confirmatory tests if that one, is, if we aren't sure of the answer. So we have tools to stop this virus. And these tools are working. So those are the three good things for today. I show this graph during each shot talk. American Healthcare Association compiles this data weekly. The red line shows cases of COVID in the general population, and the blue line shows cases of nursing home residents by week. The rise and fall of cases correlates in nursing homes correlates with the cases in the community, which is why you are required to do staff point of care testing based on the color code, red, yellow, or green of your county. You will notice the cases are finally going down in the community and the nursing homes. A new report shared that, and this is this was found on the ACA website, that the CHPE examined data from 795 nursing, 797 nursing homes that conducted their first vaccination clinic between December 18th and December 27th and compared it to nursing homes in the same county that had not yet conducted a clinic. So there are around 1,709 facilities. They found that vaccinated nursing homes experienced a 48% decline in new resident cases three weeks after the first clinic, compared to a 21% decline among non-vaccinated nursing homes located in the same county. Similarly, new staff cases declined by 33% in vaccinated nursing homes compared to 18% in non-vaccinated. Further, the positivity rates are also dropping. We're headed towards um, 
5%, which has been a goal. There were CDC guidelines that came out last week on the 10th, but I want to highlight um, what is a value for you. Um, basically, the guidelines for your care for your residents or in healthcare really did not change. You still need to use PPE. N95 respirators, eye protection, gown gloves, and caring for suspected or confirmed SARS infection. And this cl includes new admissions. They do add resource control. And this is just for, um, so that you won't pass it to someone else, if, especially if you're asymptomatic. They did add the comment about a well-fitted face mask. And they mentioned a, um, Clever way to tie that mask to make it fit your face tighter. There is also guidance related to persons who have been vaccinated, and they updated the quarantine guidance based on this criteria. But really, this is for the community quarantine, not for health care. Um, you should still continue with the same um Exposure guidelines of quarantine if they're exposed to a new, um, a new COVID case or suspected case, um, regardless of the vaccination status of the staff. However, they did say that in, um, cases where you have extreme shortages of staff or of personnel, they're vaccinated, you could consider, um, foregoing the quarantine, but you should try very hard to continue with the current guidance. Vaccinations in nursing homes. So I know that everything is on your mind about vaccinations in nursing homes, but as of the 10th, 33 million have received one or more doses in the U.S. And about almost 4 million were staff or residents of nursing homes. And actually, I did update this um, since we made the slide, so we're at around 40,000, I mean, 40 million have received the first or more doses in the U.S., which is climbing um, pretty rapidly. And, you know, three quarters of the residents are getting their vaccine, and only about a third, almost 40 percent of staff are accepting the vaccine. We hope this number will grow. Please continue to work with your pharmacy to make sure all your staff and residents get vaccinated, especially that second one. Um, and it, it is a little tricky, but we are hearing that pharmacies are willing to work in nursing homes to make sure that second dose is completed. Now we'll go into the revised criteria. Um, for quality assurance, and this has been on the top of everyone's mind because it's tied to a quality payment. So they've adjusted them quite a bit, um, and I've out, I've listed them, and I know it's like a lot of words on this slide, so I apologize for that, but I'm going to summarize it for you. So you're going to have to do a little math when you're looking at your at your numbers. So if you go out and look and see that your data did not pass QA, You'll have to do a little math problem. And um, for the first criteria, if your total confirmed positive COVID test is a whole lot more than your number of beds, you're going to get a flag. So, like, for example, if you have a 100-bed facility and you have 180 cases, that's going to be a flag. And the second one, if your total COVID test is a lot more than your total positive test, like 50% larger, you're going to get a flag. So if you reported 75 deaths and a total of 50 positive tests, you'll be flagged. And for that third criteria, if your total death, COVID death, um, to number of all beds is 15% larger, for example, 70 deaths from COVID for a 60-bed facility, you're going to get a flag. And you can read these in detail. There's also a disclaimer about or an exception if you have fewer than 25. The same thing for staff. You can read through these, but you would go through that same math exercise to try to figure out why you were flagged. 
And remember, you'll pull this data from your NHSN account, not from the CMS website. There's also two criteria, um, and basically, to, to sum these, if your if your data looks not plausible, or if it looks like your data is cumulative rather than new cases, you're still going to get flagged. So, how are you guys doing with QA and submitting on time? I pulled this out of the week ending January 31st from the CMS website. Um, it looks like. There really is just a handful, maybe a dozen or so in each state that did not submit data for whatever reason that week. Um, and that's pretty good because CMS's goal is to stay below 1% for each state. And I think that each state is, is doing that currently. Um, and because of the new criteria, it looks to me that more facilities are passing QA. So um, on this, you see just a couple, two, three, four, five, six, a few for each state. And that's really good news. But if you're one of those, you still want to make sure you're passing QA. So you want to go in and check. So here's a little math homework. Um, I won't go too far into detail, but you can use this as an example and take your data and do the math and look to see if you'll pass QA. And a reminder, every Thursday, you should check the CMS website. Here's the link. Each week, you need to export your CSV file from your NHSN account and look for data that's not plausible. If you have anything weird, that it looks weird, please go and, and audit it yourself and check it and correct it because you can correct your data on, in your NHSN account. And if you've received a flag, check your data and and correct it and then send an email um, just to make sure that they that your data has been verified and they remove the flag. And I did want to say that each Thursday you can they release a new week's worth of data. So after this call, you guys can all go to that website and look to see how your data if it passed. I'm gonna explain and I know Andrew and Robert will go into more detail, but Individuals have access to facilities through the NHSN facility account through their SANS grid card. It's not that the facility has a grid card. That's an important um, distinction. And your SANS credentials are not attached to the facility. They're attached to you, specifically your email address and when you were proofed. So individuals are connected and responsible for their grid card. You don't leave your grid card at the facility and move on. You take your grid card, you keep it in your wallet because it's yours. And you take this card and you go to the next facility, you get added as a user, and then you will be able to log in with your grid card. So there's a couple of steps in between that, but it is possible with the same card to have access to many facilities if you've been added. So to get access to a facility, another user must add you. The problem is when, if no one has access, you have to submit a change in administrator form and kind of start from scratch. So if you're, if you're leaving the facility and you are the facility administrator in NHSN, which is different than being the actual facility administrator. It means you were designated or assigned this role. But be sure to reassign the role before you leave. Karma is a real thing. When you get to your facility that you've been transferred to or you have your new job, you're going to hope that someone has access to NHSN when you arrive. And if they don't, you have to start from scratch. If you already have your grid card, it won't take very long to get access. But if you don't have your grid card, you're going to have to wait a month until they you get through the approval process, the application process, to get your card. So in order to avoid that awkwardness, I suggest um, really thinking about, thinking through this process so that many people have access to your facility.
Um, and another question that I get is people don't know who the facility administrator is. And there's a really easy way to find out. If you'll go to facility, when you're logged in to your NHSN account, go to facility, facility info. And I've cut and pasted a screenshot here, but it'll show you who the facility administrator is. And I'll bet you, you know, oftentimes that facility administrator listed is, is not the main person. They probably already, you know, somebody that's left already. So you, you need to take in the time getting that assigned correctly, reassigning it to yourself, but you actually can't click reassign and reassign it yourself. You have to fill out the change in administrator form. Now, I just want to review the best practices for reporting in the NHSN. Again, coverage. You need to strategically think about this, especially um, whether you're an independent facility or a corporate facility. For example, one way you could do this is have your NHSN facility administrator, the main person that's in charge of your account, you could designate that to be your infection preventionist. And then you could have your primary contact as someone in leadership, like your director, your DON, ADON, or someone like that. And then you want to add multiple users. You could add a consultant that works with all the facilities in your corporation or a consultant that you've hired on your own just just um, that looks that helps you with your infection prevention. Um, you could have an executive director at a sister or partner facility get access to your facility. That way, if everybody leaves that has access and hasn't reassigned, you can just call your sister facility and they could put your data in for that week. Or you could have your corporate VP be added as a user. There's many ways to make sure and ensure and safeguard your facility so that the facility will have someone, a user, with access all the time. And another thing, um, and actually at the same time as our shop talk or a little bit earlier, there was an update. Uh, NHSN did a training on the new resident impact and facility capacity pathway. But I'm sure you guys have already put data in and seen how many more questions there were. Um, they do have a slide deck that you'll be able to download with details. Um, and I did understand that you want to make all of your data retrospective to February 1st for your vaccine status. And, oh, I wanted to say that the annual survey that you see popping up Every time you log in, it is not required that you do that annual survey to continue reporting unless you report C. diff and UTI data. Um, so don't worry about that. However, I encourage you to go ahead and fill it out because at some point you will have to. And it's a really good exercise at looking at your infection control practices um, at your at your facility. Here's the link to NHSN training for point of care testing. Um, and we encourage you to go to that. Um, I believe it's, it's Monday between 10 and 11, but they'll have slides and it'll be recorded if you aren't able to. Again, we have our Shop Talk Shorts channel and I know I haven't updated anything in a while. Um, I'm, please send me um, suggestions if there's something that you find in your corporation or at your facility, some topic about reporting and infection prevention, we can add that to our Shop Talk Shorts. These are like one to two minute, maybe three minute um, YouTube videos. And last, we want you to join our group. If you will go ahead and join and confer rights to us, then that means we'll be able to help look at your data and analyze it and just ensure that everything's going along smoothly. So we really would appreciate you going ahead and joining our group. And here's the way to do that. Again, we remind you to finish your CMS-targeted COVID-19 training. That's still, I know many of you have already finished it. Keep working on that. Here is our hygiene poster that you have seen, or for those that haven't, you can download this. It's a 
kind of a clever way um, and a just a nice way to remind people to wash their hands appropriately. Oh, here's the other two trainings. The Resident Impact is coming up on the 25th, so next Thursday, and I will be attending that as well. Um, but there's, you can download the slide set if you're not going to be able to attend. Again, our Chop Talk is in the next um, March 18th, and you can go ahead and sign up. And we come to the question and answer part. We have, again, our guests. Robert and Andrew from NHSN, and they are here to answer questions. We're going to answer as many as we can. Okay, so Sonia Knox asks, are we required to enter COVID-19 vaccine data? As of this week, no, you are not required. However, it's strongly encouraged. So we would Prefer you go ahead and start putting your data in. Um, that's that's exactly how we heard it from NHSN and CMS. The next question is, uh, how do I update my email address as it has changed? Oh, awesome. I'm going to let Andrew go for that one. And we do have a Shop Talk short. Uh, you could put that in the chat, the link to that, to show you how to do it. But Andrew or Robert, would you like to take that on? Sure. Thank you, Mary Lee. The first thing you want to do, you have um, two profiles. You have one profile within the NHSN application, and you have another profile uh, in SAMS. And SAMS is our security access to make sure that all users are vetted before they enter the NHSN application. So the first thing you want to do is update your email address within the NHSN uh, application within that facility if you haven't already done so. And the way you do that is you log into that facility as you usually would. On the left-hand side, you will see a tab. What we call it a navigational panel. You will see a tab that says Users. Select that tab. Select Find and Find again the second a second time. You will see um, all the users within that facility, and mainly you will see yourself. Select your profile, and you will see edit on the bottom of the screen. And from here, you'll just edit your email address and save that information once you're finished. That'll save your information within the NHSN application. The next step is you want to update your email address in SAM second. Now, if you update your email address in SAMS first, Without updating your email address with, is within the facility in NHSN, you'll be locked out. Um, so because in order to have access to uh, any facility in NHSN, your email address within that facility must match your email address that's in SAMS. So once you uh, log in through the SAMS portal, you'll see on the left-hand side of um, in, in SAMS portal, You'll see a tab that's going to say, I think it's going to say um, user email. It's going to say email update. So you'll select that tab that says user email update. And within that, it's going to say, um, you'll see your profile is going to say change my email. You're going to select that tab that says change my email. And that's going to allow you to change your email address in SAMS. All you have to do is follow the prompts from there. Now, once you change your email address in the SAMS portal, it takes around 48 hours for that email address to update. So it may not update for up to 48 hours, which is about um, two business days. So that's the easiest way. Um, to change your email address in both NHSN and in SAMS. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so the next question is, can you walk us through the exact steps to add a user to our facility? Okay, so um, a user is very similar um, as changing your email address within the NHSN application. Now, the first thing 
you'll need um, admin rights within that facility in order to add a new user to that facility. Once you log in to that facility on the left hand side, which is the navigational panel, you'll select users on that navigational panel. And instead of selecting find, you'll select add. That's going to allow you to add a new user. And from there, you'll simply follow the prompt and just make sure that you save whatever you enter, uh, whatever information that you enter. Just make sure that you save um, that data. Now, the main thing that you'll run into, um, we use the word username and user ID uh, interchangeably. Um, but in this instance, when you're adding a user and once you select add, and you follow the prompts, you get to the point where you're entering their information, you're going to see a box that says user ID. That is a user ID that um, that you choose to make up. So I prefer users to use their first, the first letter of their uh, first initial to their first name combined with their last name or vice versa. So for me, I usually use my username as A. Turner or sometimes Turner A. And that'll allow you to uh, to complete all the required fields within that section and save your information. Once that information is saved, that user has been successfully added to that facility. And each user who's added to a facility will receive an, uh, an, an, an email from NHSN that says, welcome to NHSN. Within that email will contain a link um, that once you select that link, that link will take you to our rules of behavior page, which is, is basically a compliance on how, how should you behave within the NHSN application. Once that user accepts the rules of behavior, that will allow them to register for SAMS, where we will, uh, at the NHSN help desk, we will receive that information and we will submit a SAMS invite on that user's behalf. So I hope that kind of made any sense. Uh, Robert, do you have anything to add to that process? You know, one of the things, thank you, Andrew. One of the things that I want to make sure that they do, because it's common that we'll receive contact from users stating that I do not have the proper rights. So it's imperative that when they're being added as a user, they're provided with the rights that they'll need to add staff, um, edit staff, or any other functions that they'll need at the facility to include administrative rights if needed if it's deemed necessary by the facility administrator so they can complete all tasks at the facility level. Thank you guys. Mary Lee is showing us the required fields on the screen right now and how to add the user and, and add their rights. Um, the next question is from Michelle from below and she asks, how do I delete data from the vaccine portal at NHSN? Michelle followed up to the question um, that her vaccine data was entered to the wrong week. So she'd like to correct that data, not necessarily delete, but correct the week dates that were entered. She may have to write in to the NHSC and help desk for us to walk her through that um, example on how to edit that information. I don't want to confuse her on online here. Is that okay? I'll, Michelle, I'll put the NHSN at CDC in the answer to your question. And just so um, when you address the question, um, she can put to Andrew. Okay. Wonderful. The next question is from Mary Jane Cleveland, and she asks, what is the time frame to report POC test results? Okay, so the CMS mandate is within 24 hours. And you have two options. One is NHSN, which is strongly preferred, or you can send a file directly to your um, health department. We can get you the, um, the link for that mandate if you need it. Just let me know. Okay, the next question is from Siesta Howard. 
I have an email saying I am approved, but I have not got my grid card. How do I report the POC result via Kentucky Gateway? Well, in order to report the POC results, it's going to take the level three access. Um, the question is, does anyone else at the facility have uh, level three access? And the grid card will be coming to you in the mail. Um, there's not a specific time that I can say that it will take you to receive that card, uh, but if you have to be patient, I would say they're beginning now. Once received, once you've been approved, um, there have been users who have been receiving their grid cards within a week time period after all their documents have been approved. Thank you. I also said to reach out to your local or state health departments in the interim um, so that you can be sure to report those results within 24 hours until you get your level three access. Stephanie Peterson asked, I know they added the delete feature for staff, visitors, and contractors in the POC testing screen. At what point would we delete someone or would this only be used if someone was entered in error? Um, yes, that would only be used if someone was entered in error or if uh, you made a mistake and put the resident in the staff section, the staff in the resident staff section, and you just wanted to completely start over. So uh, off the top of my head, that would be the only reason to delete that information. Thank you. Stephanie Heron Honeycutt asks, are there are long-term care facilities required to report COVID vaccinations of residents if they're being vaccinated by the third party pharmacy like Walgreens or CVS? Um, the mandate, there isn't a mandate to report an NHSM. Amy or Andrew, I, I think I think it's related by state. Um, Yes. Yeah. And I so will say, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It is not required, from what I understand. But I will say that when NHSN releases uh, new features and functions, those tend to become required at some point in the future. So facilities who are early adapters and report in those functions have better and more robust data, and they are able to follow guidelines and requirements more accurately in the future when it does become a requirement. So it's a good it's a good practice to get into if you are able to. Yes, I totally agree. And I would just have her to make sure you check with your state health department for any uh, reporting uh, requirements. And um, NHSN is constantly, as she was saying, we're constantly working uh, with the government to improve these things. And so when mandates come down, they come down very fast. And if you have a jump on that, it just makes it that much, that much easier for you to report. Thanks, Andrew. The next question is from Karen Connor. She asked a follow-up question to adding new users. I was successful at adding two team members and they show up on the NHSN page but they did not receive their welcome to NHSN email. Should she delete them and re-add them? Uh, she is the NHSN admin. Um, go ahead, Robert. They do not need to be deleted and re-added. So it has to be that after they receive the email, welcome um, and agree to the rules of behavior. At that point in time, there's uh, information that's triggered over to us to submit an invite for them. In the event that that process is not working correctly, then at that point in time, you can identify the names of those individuals by submitting an email to us, and we can manually submit one uh, for the users. Robert, to tag team on that, and what I've noticed, in fact, it happened this week, a administrator had added a new person but typed their email address wrong. Mm. So that happens and I know when I'm doing screen sharing with people when they're adding users, I 
you can joke, but or you can laugh, but I say, okay, check it four times. You know? <laughs> That's correct. And one of the things that I want to say, all the information that we're referring to in regards to how to add users and, you know, what should I, um, what information needs to be submitted, you can find it by going to the NHSN website, but we want to answer all questions that we can today while on this call. But if you go to the NHSN website, you go to the LTC uh, COVID-19, there is a host of information in regards to CMS requirements, how to enroll the facility. All that information is on there, and there is um, details even on the trainings and stuff that we hold, uh, more updated information as the information comes available. The next question is from Candace Shoemaker on reporting COVID-19 data for healthcare employees. The numbers are correct on our end, but they are rejected. What shall we do about this? Uh, what I'm suggesting, if you have an instance like that, an issue like that, please submit a ticket to us to nhsn at cec.gov um, so we can troubleshoot the issue um, that's being presented and we can see uh, exactly what's going on with that particular um, which our facility and see if this is a possible defect or something else may have been done wrong. The next question is from Mary Jane Cleveland. How long should it take to get my staff level three of security? We requested several months ago and uh, still have not gotten the email with information. Go ahead, Robert. Okay, so just to let everyone know that listening, there have been uh, instances where people have aged out of the process when submitting their documents. Um, what may have happened is the information could have been submitted incorrectly, but we are working in conjunction with the SAMS department, uh, the SAMS help desk, to ensure that all people who have submitted their documents will be added in a timely manner. So if you have submitted documents previously, there sh should be no need to resubmit your information. Um, and if you have aged out, they are going through a list of people who have aged out of the system and re inviting those personnel to make sure that they receive an invite. And just for clarification, uh, Robert, what is the how, what is aging out of the system? What's that time frame? So aging out. So say after the initial uh, invite, um, you have uh, sixty days. If I'm is that correct, Andrew, to make sure yes. that um, you submit your information back to SAMS for the proofing process. If it's yes. not accessed within that time period, the the invite will age itself out. So it it, it expires after sixty days. And so we had so many um invites, you know, as you guys know, over sixteen thousand uh SAMs were swamped and a little behind. So some of those invites they weren't able to get to in time before they aged out. Uh Sarah Russell asked about uh, a resident who is in the 90-day post-COVID window for not testing, should we PCR test them within 14 days post-vaccine? And Sarah, I believe there is um, guidance for post-vaccine testing and handling of residents um, on the CDC website. And her second question is about the SAMS uh, documents, which are also found on the NHSN website. She has her uh, state driver's license and federal ID, asking if those are sufficient. So it should be fine to submit. Go ahead, Robin. No, I was just going to say the same. That should be fine to submit for the proofing process. Uh, Bob Richardson is, has the next question. Um, if you're reporting POC antigen tests to your state, do you have to report those tests to NHSN if your state is reporting those to CDC? And uh, the answer to that, 
job is to follow your state guidelines. Um, and HSN is, again, a preferred method. Um, but if your state is um, has a system set up for you to report, then that is acceptable as well. They just have to be reported within 24 hours per your CLIA waiver. Uh, the next question, uh, Mary Jane, can you repeat who we can email to get employees to welcome to MHSN information? So if, if they have a question, they need to contact uh, one, one of us at uh, CDC. What they can do is submit that um, ticket to NHSN at cdc.gov. You can make that either to the attention of Robert Maxwell or Andrew Turner. And also, um, the events, you know, that has transpired this year um, with COVID-19, um, NHSN, not only do we um, follow, we have users following the uh, long-term care component, we also have other components as well. So it caused us to be um, inundated with thousands upon thousands of tickets. So over the um, course of time, and especially um, over the last month, we've made every effort to um, answer as many users as possible. But we're getting closer and closer to answering um, users within a um, timely fashion. So I know many users have been um, emailing the NHS and help desk and may have not heard or been responded to within um, a reasonable amount of time. Um, so we are making every effort to make sure that we are responding to everyone within a reasonable amount of time. And we are on the brink of being able to um, catch up with all inquiries that are coming in. The last question is from Linda. And Linda, I am trying to log in right now to screen share the POC data entry. With and just for reference, um, Linda was asking if somebody could share a screenshot of where the point of contact data is to be entered on the NHSN website. So thank you, Amy. Okay, so Linda, we enter the point of care test result here under COVID-19. We have to log in with our level three access. We go to the point of care test result reporting. And this is where you enter your resident or staff or visitor information, their ID. If you have entered them before, you can use find function. So we'll enter John Appleseed's information. Uh, this is uh, some new fields for ethnicity and race since I've last entered Johnny Appleseed's information, so I'm going to have to edit his information. And, uh, and then we can add his results, okay? And then when oh. I'm here, we have our test result that shows, and we can go to the next. Go ahead, sorry. I did see that Linda responded. Um, if we just got our level three clearance, should we go back and enter past data? For point of care test results, I would say no, as long as you have reported those timely to your health department. Um, I don't, I would not say you need to go back. Mary Lee or Andrew, Robert? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, if you, you could stay right there for a minute. Um, I can address the question that was asked earlier. If you look down there where it says the POT set testing results, if you need to delete anything, you'll see the delete with a trash can there. And that's how you'll delete all the information for that particular POC testing results. And Amy, if you can um, do what you just did and open up uh, one of those tests, this is how you can edit any information that was in there um, that you may have entered incorrectly. So she changed the date. I think um, the user said that the date was entered incorrectly. Now the date has been changed, and all you have to do is make sure that all the required fields with the asterisk are filled out and to save that information. 
Amy, one other item of note while you're on this page, you see where it's all those who can view says where it says resident, staff, visitor. If your view of what you can see on this page is limited to resident, then that means that additional rights need to be added to your profile to add staff. So you would want to communicate with your uh, facility administrator to have that added so you can do that. Does anybody have any further questions we can answer? And if not, we will um, wrap this up and thank Mary Lee for her great update and information and Andrew and Robert for joining us today. Uh, if you have questions, um, I believe here is my contact and Mary Lee's contact information. Please email or give us a call. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Amy, if you are still available, we do have a few more questions that have come in to oh. the Q&A. Um, okay. Oh, I see Vicki um, asked, are all residents entered or just the positive report? Um, we are entering all positive and negative data for every test that you run, and that is part of the CLIA waiver. So work again with your local health department or state health department on if um, we don't want you duplicating your work. So if you're already having a system for reporting results to your health department, um, then you can continue that. If you are using NHSN, we do ask that you enter positive and negative, and that is part of that CLIA waiver that you have. And then Karen asks, what is the CMS expectation for staff members completing the targeted COVID-19 training? Are they tracking numbers? Yes, Karen, that is an excellent question, and we appreciate you asking that. CMS does um, follow the, the numbers, and um, we have quality advisors reaching out to our um, nursing homes um, asking about the training and if it's been completed. For those of you who haven't completed it, it's excellent training for frontline and leadership. There's two separate modules, or there's actually a couple extra modules for management and leadership, and the frontline staff modules are excellent. Um, we can drop that into our follow-up email for you, the link for that training. Um, but it's excellent. It's free. And um, I've been practicing infection prevention for uh, many years now, and I learned quite a bit from those modules as well. So I uh, highly encourage that you take them, and CMS is looking for a uh, increased percentage of nursing home frontline staff taking that, that training. Thank you for joining us, and that concludes Shop Talk for today.